I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. But now, the Lord says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Jesu, for thy woundest smart on feet and on thy handest too, make me meek and low of heart, and thee to love as I should do, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Isaiah 49 and Matthew 28 bear witness 
to the fact that it is out of the darkest place that the mission of the gospel is sent. Nothing less. It's, it's a very strange thing when you think about it. <clears throat> Isaiah, if you listen to him, comes really to the end of his world. He has, uh, uh, if we think, what we think about him is true, in the preaching to a congregation of Israel surrounded by its enemies, the leadership of whom has already been deported to Babylon in the 6th century B.C., and yet, still in all of that evidence, they don't seem to want to listen to true assessment of their spiritual condition. To the point that he has virtually given up. In this moment, he says, I've labored in vain, and I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Now, <clears throat> If, uh, if Isaiah is a normal person, and I think we can assume he is, that is to say he's not a plaster saint, he is a human being, the natural reaction would be not to put a semicolon at the end of that phrase, but a full stop, to roll up the scroll, and to turn to the wall. And that's what many of us do, at least for a time. I don't think missionaries are, are any exception. Surely the prophets are full of deep passages in which they cry out their discouragement to the Lord. And Jeremiah, will you be to me as a deceitful book? O Lord, thou hast tricked me, and I was deceived. I think we can certainly say the same of many of uh, whoever he was. There is a historical person probably behind us, actually the, uh, the uh, chief candidate for that position among recent scholarship appears to be an Irish missionary named Finney. Not the boldness of someone going off across rough seas uh, into uh, southern Scotland, into a very warlike people whose language was at least massively different, if anything like it, bearing a strange faith concerning which they had heard nothing and had no apparent reason uh, to, uh, to take on, since it did not qualify itself in any way for any part of the market share of what people were mainly interested in those days, which was mainly uh, a God who could increase their wealth and slaughter their enemies. And here he was, preaching a crucified Jesus. I wonder how it worked out for him, how much discouragement he experienced in that little place. I don't buy the hagiography of Archbishop Usher, among other wonderful stories. I mean, the stories are wonderful, but wonderful. <laughs> uh, in which my, my favorite is uh, that he sought to build a church and <clears throat> what couldn't find rafters uh, for the roof uh, and turned around and they were being brought out of the woods in the antlers of stags. <laughs> would that our missions would be so easily gratified. I remember preaching in a place in Uganda called the Poyo little village a few miles from Sarodi in northeastern Uganda, the heart of uh, the place where the Lord's Resistance Army had been devastating villages and abducting children and uh, killing thousands. And in that little place, there was a mud-walled church that was absolutely packed uh, to the nines. <clears throat> and the uh, rector at the end of it asked me if I would join him and his wife and pray for their accommodation, uh, which alluded to the half-built brick house that was outside. And I said, um, and what had you been living in up to this point? He said, well, we don't live there anymore, but we used to. I said, what was it? He said, it was the hut that was built by the missionary. 
This meant the first missionary in 1880 who came to that place from England under the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. It was a poor, miserable little hut in a sun-baked place with, of all things, it's amazing how the English get things absolutely perfectly. A, a tin roof and door, sort of like an oven. And I asked, had it always been that way? He said, oh yes. And whenever we, we placed the roof, we did it exactly the way we thought he wanted. <laughs> how much discouragement in that place? And how much discouragement now? Bishop of Sarodi, responsible for half a million Anglican Christians, gathered in 360 congregations, hungry for the word of God, with 60 priests. How much discouragement. I've labored in vain, and I've spent my strength for nothing and for vanity. And yet it is exactly in that place that God speaks a word to and through Isaiah. It's a word for him and it's a word from him. It's an astonishing promise. It isn't just a word to say, oh, I know things are tough now, but you know, they'll, they'll be better. You, you'll, you'll feel better in a, in a few weeks. It's, everyone goes through these things. You know, missionary work is, is tough. You'll get your congregation back. You'll get your gifts back. You'll, they'll sooner or later start to listen to you. But God doesn't say any of that. None of it at all. Instead, he says something completely different. And as you listen to this passage, as you read it, to yourself and hear hope start to gather underneath that discouragement until it breaks through. You realize that the vision that he has been being given is not just improbable or audacious, but practically impossible. Absolutely unbelievable in the world's terms that a man in such depths should be lifted to such heights for the sake of what God wanted to do with him. He says, I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And if you look inside that passage for some reasons why Isaiah should be so hopeful, you're pretty hard-pressed to find him. <clears throat> it is true he does look around, he does remember that God has used him in the past, and that's a good thing. And then he also does look at God's call to him and understand that in fact he has been called by God and, and so he's willing to trust that but those things don't add up to enough of a reason to supply this vision that somehow the preaching of a prophet who can't get through his own to his own people by means of his discouragement will actually be turned into something through which the word of God reaches beyond Israel to the nations of the world, to the ends of the earth, teaching all disciples to, be, to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And as I thought about this, I wondered, what is it? What is it that gives this vision? Is it just a peculiar supernatural gift for the prophet in this moment? Or is it something deeper, more reliable, and more common? And then I remembered a doctrine 
that is easy to forget. Some people don't believe it. And most seminarians, if you ask them about this, will pad their answers desperately to see if they can get out 25 words on the subject. But it's in the creed. And he descended to the dead, the harrowing of hell, a hugely popular motif in the Middle Ages, and one witness to in Scripture. One, in fact, which the early church preached on across the board and that forms the basis for that beautiful uh, template in which many icons of the resurrection in the Byzantine tradition are drawn. You may know them, they're called the Anastasis, the Christ raised from the dead with the gates of hell falling into darkness underneath his feet, and one hand reaching to pick up Eve, and the other reaching to take the hand of Adam, the first parents, lifting them out of the earth as they look at him with relief and gratitude and adoration. It's that place of worldly, eternal, and infinite discouragement into which Christ descends in order to preach to the departed, and by his preaching lift them into the light. And I suggest that it's that event, that doctrine, that moment, which reaches backwards and forwards into time and becomes not only the basis for all missionary activity, as Christ is the missionary to hell, but also the power by which missionary vision comes to those who are entrusted with it. And it can't begin any other place than the place of the cross, which in our human experience is a place of discouragement. So this isn't just an occasion of darkness that has turned marvelously into light, but rather what this text is saying and the rest of the scripture witnesses to, that it's discouragement that becomes the very cradle of hope. And because it is the cradle of hope, it's also the birthplace of true mission out of which we're sent into the world. I thought, when I <coughs> was ordained, that God was going to use me my we just discovered the uh, photographs of my ordination to the priesthood, and there was more pomp and ceremony around it. It was at St. Thomas Church, Fifth Avenue. I'm surprised I ever got over it. Um, it, was, it, it was beautiful, magnificent. It was like uh, some kind of coronation. I, uh, you know, the only thing missing was the sedan chair. <laughs> I get one of those, don't I? <laughs> and, uh, and I had a wonderful curacy and uh, was adored by everyone, which is every curate's birthright. And, uh, and then I was called to be chaplain at the Episcopal Church of Yale and had a wonderful ministry there to a very um, run-down community and over the years built it up into a magnificent place. And, and then I was called to be rector of the Church of the Epiphany in New York City troubled and hurting congregation. Uh, and, and into that I walked <laughs> full of good ideas. <laughs> Beware a new rector full of good ideas. <laughs> and I was surprised when everything that had worked for me before suddenly stopped working. The things that I had thought were the treasures of my ministry were thrown back in my face. I thought that I had been sent there, you see, to do something with that place rather than just to start by loving its people. I've since learned a few things. And, and I realized in the 
the middle of it that the problem had been, you see, that up to that point, my attitude was that I was really glad that God had given me a successful ministry, and I was so pleased he wanted to help. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that was the moment in which he decided to give me a time of holy discouragement. Nothing worked. Um, I, they fought me at every turn, and that made me angry and resentful. And then I found they began fighting each other. And I began to be not just discouraged, but deeply depressed. I said to myself, I've labored in vain, and I've spent my strength for nothing and for vanity. In the middle of this, one Valentine's Day, my wife gave me an icon. It's a little diptych of Jesus. Um, it all happened afterwards if you'd like to look at it. On the one side, he's being laid in the tomb, his body broken, his, his countenance completely fallen, and his mother, who is laying his body into the grave, embracing him in such a way, and I'm still not sure how the artist does this, that you can see her bottom lip quiver the way we do when we cried so long we can't cry anymore. And on the other side is Christ in glory. He looks like a kid at the top of a trampoline jump. A nimbus behind him, radiant shards of gold and blue light framing his body. And as I looked at it, I understood what she was saying to me. She was saying, darling, I know you're here, but you're going to be here. I know you. And as I looked at it, I thought, how did she know that? How can that possibly happen? And then suddenly it occurred to me that Christ had heralded my He was not just doing it in the abstract and not just for Adam and Eve and the unfortunate patriarchs who lived before the birth of Jesus as the doctrine was popularly expounded in the 14th century. He was heralding my help, your help. Your present and past places of discouragement and all those future times which are hidden from you but which in this life you can more or less count on, in which you will be tempted to say, I've labored in vain. I spent my strength for nothing and for vanity. And in the harrow, he began to raise me up. He taught me, he shaped me, and he sent me to another parish and then to another, and finally here. I know as a diocese, you have been through so much. I continue to hear the stories. Sometimes they're just hard. Stories of collapse and enmity and separation, of hard words and lifelong friendships that have suddenly been ruined, of children who had friends and then turned around and wondered where their friends had gone. Sometimes when someone is recounting one of these, even though they may have said it a dozen times before, they stop and have to pause for a little while before they can go on. And as I listen in the silence, I hear
hear the words of Isaiah, I've labored in vain. I've sent my strength for nothing in vain. But then, I think that's the point, you see. God is using this experience. He is breaking open the church that is seen in order to reveal the church that has been unseen. He is out of that place of discouragement, pouring into us even now his love and his light and his blessing, because the world is starving for such things. Since outside of Christ, discouragement only has a very few ineffective and temporary antidotes. But in Christ, nothing less than the harrowing of hell has occurred. And that is the light that God wants us to take beyond these doors. So perhaps in the time remaining, if you wouldn't mind, as you sit or stand in your pew and sing and pray, would you pray for Betsy and me as we tremble on the sill of this new adventure? Would you pray for this diocese whom God loves for which Jesus gave his life? But would you also pray with confidence to the Lord that God will show you how he will use you in this next part of our great adventure in the gospel together? How he will use you out of your experience of discouragement to become part of his light to the nations so that in fact his salvation will reach to the ends of the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen alive.